so often people take to the trails because it is a lot more comfortable, it's safe, and it is um, a little bit more convenient for them. And so we want to try to make those parts and pieces work for all of active transportation and get our partners to see that the trail system that they're building currently can, can pivot to that and can be used for that as well. Um, and again, it's just kind of sh changing mindsets, changing kind of the, the, um, the, the way we think about things. And that is a lot of times through conversations, through advocacy and through the volunteers and the others that have the same passion that we have at Bike Walk. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Emily Hanna, Executive Director of Bike Walk Central Florida. Uh, we're talking a little bit about the things that they are trying to do to help support the cities in that region to become safer for uh, people walking and biking and help transform that built environment. Uh, it's a wonderful discussion, but it's a long one. So let's get right to it with Emily Hanna. Emily, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I love to have my guests uh, just kind of take a moment to introduce themselves to the audience. So I will give you the floor. Who's Emily? <laughs> so my name is Emily Hanna. I am the executive director of Bike Walk Central Florida, which is a nonprofit advocacy organization in our region that promotes trails and sidewalks, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety and education. Um, prior to that, I was the development services manager of the city of Castleberry, Florida, uh, where I managed their planning department, their building department, and their CRA. The work that I did for the city of Castleberry won me a 40 under 40 award from the Orlando Business Journal in 2019. Um, and that was really for working with developers and the community to negotiate what those needs were and to, and to build it and make it happen. Um, and we've collectively, it's not just me, there's other people that were a part of the city, but we've collectively changed the direction of the city positively. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later in the podcast. Additionally, outside of that, I serve on five different advisory boards, two of which are professional development organizations in Central Florida related to planning. I have a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of Central Florida, uh, where I'm also an adjunct professor teaching in their undergraduate urban planning course. Courses. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'm gonna. I, 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 as I was mentioning before we hit the record button, I was fascinated by this uh, the, this geography in this area. I mean, obviously, we hear a lot about Orlando and the Orlando area, and of course, uh, you know, way down here in in, in sort of this lower. Uh, left segment of, of this map is where Disney World is and Epcot and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we've got the, you know, the International Airport, which is, you know, sort of right here. Uh, but, you know, that city that you were just talking about, Castleberry, I've got that highlighted here. So you were there for what, four or five years? Mm -hmm. Four years total. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, it, it seems like you, you rose through the ranks rather quickly there. And obviously you made a little bit of a splash. I did. <laughs> I did. The The city was really, um, you know, I, I started out right out of my master's program, right out of school. Uh, they hired me as an entry level planner. And I really wanted to, to flex my planning muscles, if, if you will. Right. Um, so I came in to um, uh, an opportunity to really build their planning department. Yeah, there was okay. a couple people that were leaving, their director was retiring. So I had an opportunity to bring in staff that um, I had worked with prior and um, and had graduated with me in the UCF program. So most of the planners that had worked at the city since, since I have been there have been graduates of the master's program from UCF. So it's um, kind of a great pipeline, if you will, to bring in um, entry level planners and give them that experience. But Ultimately, what I was really fortunate enough to, to be is, is to work with public works, to work with our code enforcement department. Um, and then I wrote a lot of the policy for the city. So I worked with a lot of different departments and really understood the functions of the city early on um, and realized that a lot of the, the policy that was written was from 1990s and early 2000s and was really um, policy that was dedicated and, and really descriptive of a suburban community. And we really wanted 
wanted to increase our density and intensity along some of the major thoroughfares that kind of bisected the city. Um, and that would be 1792 and State Road 436. These roads have um, so upwards of 50,000 vehicles traveling daily down those roads. Um, and so it's really difficult to kind of build an urban form when you have the volume that you're having through your city. And so ultimately, we, we wrote change policy. We worked with developers to try to get the kind of the best of both worlds. It's really difficult to try to get you know, a, a mixed use building right up against a seven lane major arterial. Developers really don't want to do that. They want to be set off a little bit. So we, we really worked with the, the development community to try to get kind of the stepping block, the stepping stones, if you will, to build kind of where we wanted to go, but obviously knew that it was going to be difficult to get there with just the, the conditions of the um, roadways and some of the, um, the other um, surrounding properties weren't quite as valuable. They weren't, they were often set back. It was a lot of drive-throughs. That's what's really common um, on those major thoroughfares. But like I said, we changed a lot of the policy. We made sure that the development community saw those policies before they were adopted and were willing to work within those policies because you write them, they might not come. And then right. now you're kind of, you know, pigeonholing yourself into having something maybe sit empty for a while without any type of economic activity. Um, so ultimately, that's why we made those, those policies really flexible. Developers loved it, came in, really started building what we call um, a part of uh, what we call it as affordable housing, but apartments essentially in the city um, really didn't have a lot of multifamily until we kind of changed some of those rules. And now we have a lot of multifamily. And why that is important is because the city really wanted to build up their tax base in order to bring in more businesses and specifically more restaurants. And we really didn't have the household median income to support the, the, where the restaurants wanted to locate, where their market area was. So we had to bring in more, more people uh, that made more money and raise the median income so that we could bring in the goods and services that the city really wanted. To the north, east, south, and west are other communities that have these restaurants, that have these types of social and, and cultural and economic places. But really, the city of Castleberry was really kind of designed to drive through and not necessarily stay. And so that was ultimately our charge was to try to change the policy so that we could build an environment that people would want to linger in and shop in and stay at restaurants and things. Um, so a little bit of economic development, but that was really key, I think, in order for me to see the larger picture at play um, and that I, in order for me to really change the context of 1792 and the 436 and of, of other major thoroughfares and communities, I couldn't stay in Castleberry. I had to go and, and work for either a county or another agency that could have that impact. Um, and ultimately, that's kind of how and why I got involved with Bike Walk Central Florida. Okay, cool. And uh, and you had mentioned a, a couple of times there uh, about the university. So uh, again, if we zoom in a little bit here on the map, we can see that the university has starred out here, uh, and it looks like it's a it's a very interesting uh, campus. It's all mm -hmm. in sort of like this circular pattern. And as I understand, is this true? The central Central Florida University is one of the largest. Excuse me, the University of Central Florida is one of the largest universities in the United States. Is that correct? It is. Um, I believe, I don't know if it surpassed, I think it was Arizona State University was the largest. Um, but the last I saw, we had over 53,000 students enrolled um, right. at the university, um, making it one of the largest in the country. So that's their main campus that's um, on the east side of Orange County. Uh, they've also constructed a downtown campus with partnership of private developers and the city of Orlando. Um, and that's actually located... Um, right across the street from our office. And they have um, essentially moved some of the colleges and, and um, schools down there already, including the master's in urban and regional planning program, architecture, and um, some others that are in the public administration school. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I, I, we, we can move on from the university uh, at this point, but that, that uh, prompts a nice question that I'll have for Natalia uh, Barber, who is uh, a professor who has joined the University of Figure Out where she's at, whether she's at the downtown campus or, or out at the main campus. So that's good. Have you met Natalia yet? 
I've not. No. Okay. You'll, you'll definitely want to. <laughs> she's a, <laughs> she's a firecracker and uh, she's been on the podcast before when she lived in uh, Delft in the, in the Netherlands uh, and was a professor at, uh, um, at uh, TU Delft. Uh, but yeah. I did want to linger just a little bit more on this map simply to also say that acknowledge the fact that you're a horse person and so you live up in uh, in the geneva area you have some land up there and then make uh the 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 hardcore commute all the way down into central orlando or into the the center yeah. of orlando what what's that like <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I get to work from home, so I don't necessarily yeah. have to come into the office all the time. You know, our our staff and our team at Bike Walk work remote, but we have a central location where we do meet and do okay. meet with partners and things. So that's why we have a hub kind of in downtown Orlando. Um, but ultimately, we really travel to our partners and our partners are, are essentially our clients for a, a lack of a better term in a nonprofit world. They're our partners. And really, we go to them. So I will go right. down to the city of Castleberry. I will go to Kissimmee. I will go to Apopka, city of Orlando. We don't normally have meetings at our office. It's really just internal. Um, right. But the drive can be, um, you know, lengthy. And prior to me living in Geneva, I actually um, bought property in um, Deltona, which is closer to the SunRail, which is our commuter train. Um, and that commuter train comes to downtown Orlando. And so for um, several years when I lived in that house, I did take the train. It was still an hour uh, one way right. Um, right. on the commuter train. And then I'd walk to wherever my office was or wherever I worked at the time. And then would often and commute back. Um, and that worked out really well. I, I loved riding the SunRail, but unfortunately I needed more land. And so I had to sell and I moved to um, Geneva, which doesn't have that connection. I would have to drive quite a distance just to get to the train. So it just makes sense just to drive into the office. But um, right. I try not to do it as often. And um, we do have uh, bike storage here in the office. So when I am here, I can take one of the bikes out. We also have scooters and bike share um, in downtown Orlando as well, along with a, a circulator called the limo. Um, so it's our um, quick service kind of bus that takes you kind of to some of the activity centers and big points of interest in downtown. Uh, so I'll often hop on that when I'm downtown to get to wherever I need to go. Um, so there's lots of options for multimodal transportation when you're in these hubs uh, that host it. Where I'm at in Geneva, not so much. That is going to be more your large trucks and SUVs and some of those um, ATVs and off-road vehicles. So yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. not quite bikes and peds. <laughs> <laughs> not quite bikes and peds out, out there. All right. So let's. So you mentioned you. you so you made that change. You wanted to get more engaged in uh, in this sort of uh, world and and start uh, you know really trying to transform. Uh, an environment which it, my impression of the Orlando general area there, uh, including, you know, Castleberry and all that, is it's just kind of like you said, it was kind of developed after, you know, post-World War II, uh, mm -hmm. very much along the lines of the car. And so my impression of it is it's not a very walkable and bikeable place. Is that a correct impression? Generally speaking, you're absolutely correct. It's not a very walkable and bikeable space for right now. Now, I will say that individually, our um, city and county partners um, are working on making those connections, identifying where there might be sidewalk gaps um, or where there might be opportunities to add um, additional trail segments. Um, and we have a really robust proposed trail master plan. That can be something we can look at later. Um, but ultimately, the cities are working on that individually. Our job, really a bike walk, is to have them connect and have them talk to each other and make sure that the trails that they're planning or the sidewalk connections that they're planning or even new development that's going in, a new school has connections to those communities so that it makes it simpler and easier for you to walk or ride your bike versus just going to the first thing that you know and that we're all comfortable with, which is getting into our automobile and driving where we need to go. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I'm blown away by the scale of this. When I looked at uh, the the central Florida <laughs> metropolitan area, it's like 4,000 square miles. I mean, it, this is a massive, massive area. And then when you look at, you know, the, the built up areas, I mean, the, Orlando itself is not that huge. Uh, it's about a, just under a million people, and I guess it's like a over just over a hundred square miles. So it's not massive in in terms of. I mean, you know, we're we're 
you know, three times that size here in Austin, uh, but in terms of square miles and then just over a million people, uh, 2.5 or 2.6 million people in that metropolitan area. So you guys are a bit, you, you have a lot to chew off of here. This is massive. <laughs> it is. Um, we often compare it to the size of Delaware, um, mm -hmm. the state. So as far as the square mileage goes, that's really the, the coverage that we have. And then, um, you know, population, uh, not quite the same or a little bit less than the, the state of Delaware, but comparable. You had mentioned the city of Orlando is kind of a hub. We have the city of Sanford, which is the north, which is um, a hub as well. And then the city of Kissimmee, which is to the south. So we've got cities kind of developed in between the um, city of Orlando and then some of the other um, activity centers, points of interest, things like that. So it might seem sprawl, but really there's a lot of little incorporated cities that, that make up kind of that, those bedroom communities, if you will, that surround downtown Orlando. Right, yeah. So here, here's the mission, vision, and values. Uh, walk us through this. You know, who, tell us all about uh, Bike Walk Central Florida. <laughs> so Bike Walk Central Florida um, started in 2010 when a, um, among other things, but ultimately the Dangerous by Design report put out by Smart Growth America came out. There you go, right there. Uh, thank you. And uh, so that was in um, 2011. That report came out and basically identified um, the Orlando metro area. So everywhere from Sanford all the way down to Kissimmee and everywhere in between um, is one of the most dangerous places for people to walk. Um, we had the highest percentage of fatalities based on the percentage of people that did walk for commute, which is how uh, the Dangerous by Design report statistics were determined at the time. Um, and so that raised a lot of red flags for a lot of, you know, um, a lot of red flags for the city of Orlando, Orange County, um, our local transportation planning organization, Metropolitan, um, Metroplan Orlando. And so um, at that time, uh, Bike Walk Central Florida was just forming. We were formed out of a grant from the Winter Park Health Foundation, um, and they still exist, and we still work with them today. Um, but ultimately, they kind of founded Bike Walk of the impression that we really needed to create more civility around people that walk and bike, and drivers really just disrespect people that walk and bike. We think it's those people, and um, we don't necessarily respect who they might be or where they might be going. And we think that when we're in a vehicle, that we're more important than anybody else. And so we're going to continue to drive past them or we're going to continue to do whatever dangerous behavior we're doing in our car. And we blame the pedestrian um, often because they just randomly cross the road, right? But we right. don't necessarily design our roads to make it safer for people to cross. So Ultimately, that led us to, to form the nonprofit and start one of our signature programs, the Best Foot Forward Pedestrian Safety Program, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but really, the, the mission, vision, and values of Bike Walk is to bring that civility back to Central Florida, to really um, remind drivers and remind people, because we all are drivers, but some of us don't have driver's license, like those that are under the age of 16. And we have a huge senior population in nice. Florida, specifically, and in Central Florida. And some of those drivers, some of those people have to drive because they, they don't have safe connections or places to walk or bike to do go to the doctor's office or go to the grocery store, those normal activities. Um, so we kind of have a range of different audiences that we're trying to to tell everybody to watch out for and to be more um, respectful for and civil around. Um, and, and that we do through the series of programs, doing education, um, and really speaking and engaging with different audiences about uh, the driver yield law, so why it's a Florida law it's for you to stop and let somebody cross the road. In addition to the statistics that we have as being one of the worst in the country, um, it's striking people just trying to walk across the street. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a lot of thoughts come to mind, uh, you know, dur during your your overview of that. And, and one of them is is really that we have a lot of challenges, and, and I'll pull up your your programs and services uh, slide here. Um, you've got the the best foot for the bike five, the uh, the healthy uh, West Orange Trail connections, the passing the packing district, um, and it says this is College Park. So is this the the, the university area? Uh, it's just north of the university. Um, just north of the university, and then uh, bike walk kids. One of the biggest challenges in advocacy, especially with the Safer Streets advocacy and Vision Zero advocacy, is 
that challenge. It's and, and part of the challenge, of course, is and you you touched upon it a little bit is there is this default that we go through in North America, which is we drive. It's mm-hmm. the roads are built for driving. And everybody drives and the world then revolves around us driving. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the problem, of course, is that oftentimes that then when we look at safety programs and initiatives, it shifts the onus of safety and not being killed to the more vulnerable users, which really annoys the hell out of me. Um, And from a public health perspective, which is my background, I know that that's not the way to go. Um, We really need to like lean heavily into the engineering uh, Mm -hmm. of our streets to slow motor vehicle drivers down and not using enforcement and initiatives and education to try to, you know, coerce that because it's so powerful. You, you talked about it before of, of that impact of, you know, these six lane strodes and, and mm-hmm. it's just built for speed and, and we're humans. I mean, one of the, one of my f- most favorite Walt Disney uh, cartoons uh, was from the 1950s before you know, before Walt Disney World, (laughs) 1950s, where he talked about this. Motor Mania was the name of that little uh, goofy, you know, cartoon skit. And it was, you know, uh, Mr. Walker and and Mr. Driver. And and, and it's that transformation, that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde transformation that happens to humans when they get behind the, the, the wheel of an automobile and turn into just a murderous maniac behind the wheel. Um, And so it's in part of that challenge that we all have in trying to make safer communities is, is really kind of honing in on what needs to happen. Talk a little bit about that side of it, because there's an engineering slide that we'll, we'll go to here in just a moment. Um, Since you know where I'm coming from, I'm engineering first. I'm mm-hmm. like, we need to get our engineering. Talk a little bit about that from a partner perspective of working with the cities and the counties and the regional areas <laughs> to try to get through and, and break through that transformation of um, a built landscape that's already auto dominated. Mm. Uh, it's a that's a very tough, I think, um, a question to, to answer, honestly, but what I would like to start with, I guess, is explaining how um, our best foot forward pedestrian safety program works, because I think that that is going to be my good introduction as to how I then advocate for some of the things that you spoke of, John. Um, yeah. And so first and foremost, most I should say all of our partners, the cities and the counties that I had listed earlier. And I think there's a slide earlier that actually shows all of the partners. Um, so all of those partners from city of Sanford and um, Longwood, Castleberry, all the way down to Kissimmee and St. Cloud, um, all have different types of staff all have different types of characteristics of their community. They all have different goals. They all have different types of roadways. They all have different types of development strength constraints. Um, and so you have to take those into consideration when you go down and you work with any individual partner. Um, Orange County is going to be a little bit different than how Seminole County might react to what Osceola County does. Um, and so working with these individual partners and knowing kind of who those engineers are, what their background is, understanding those and having those relationships is probably the the first most important thing with with you advocating for anything. I'm not going to go in and say you need to eliminate a lane when I know Osceola County's goal is to grow some of their um, you know areas just south of where the attractions are. And they're not of the mindset to um, eliminate lanes to widen multimodal transportation options for others. But that's going to come with time. They've got a robust trail system down there that they're building. Um, And so that's a step in the right direction. And so you have to pivot where you can and support the positive environment changes that they are making because they're already in their capital improvement plans, their CIPs. So that's already been determined by their commission. And they've got directives to do that. So One of the things that I try to do is understand what the community's goals are um, that we work with and then try to figure out the compromises to get to move the needle. And then I'll get the advocacy in when I can. So, for example, if they're building a 10 foot wide trail on the side of a four lane, 45 mile an hour road with the center divided median, I'll say, 
you know, your, your lane widths are 12 feet. Is there any way that we could go down and narrow those to 10 feet by ourselves, maybe stripe in the curb a little bit. So we have a two foot curb section and then maybe widen that trail section from 10 to 12 feet because the right of way exists. You have a buffer that's built in from your curb section. And now where you've kind of put that stripe out, um, narrowing those lanes. Um, and that gives um, a better buffer to those that are using that multi-use trail or that multi-use path. You have wider options for that multi-use path. And now the drivers just narrowly, by, by just changing the striping, I, we didn't change the geography of the roadway at all, um, are narrowed a little bit. Now, because it's still four lanes, yes, they're likely to continue to speed because of the width of the roadway in general. But making these small, tiny incremental improvements start to show the traffic engineers and the planners that mm. that does make an impact. And if you do a little pilot project here or there within a community and they see that impact, they are likely going to continue um, making those changes. And, and I will, this is a great example of the city of Kissimmee um, was a partner, has been a partner of the Best Foot Forward Pedestrian Safety Program for some time now. Um, and the numbers, the percentages that you see there, the 30% and the 78% um, are what we call our driver yield rate. And so what we do is we send data collectors out. We monitor over 100 crosswalks in the Best Foot Forward program. We send these data collectors out and they cross the road um, and they mark down whether or not the driver stops and lets them cross or stops and lets the pedestrian cross, whether or not the driver um, makes a, a um, invasive maneuver to go around the pedestrian, right? Or so that or they might slam on their brakes and, and kind of screech around or they just, you know, past the pedestrian altogether and don't even see that they're there, right? Um, right. But with that, where we don't just send people out to cross the road, that's incredibly dangerous. There's something called a dilemma zone. Um, and that dilemma zone is essentially the distance that a car needs to stop based on the speed limit. Um, we always try to assume that no one's doing the speed limit. So a lot of times our dilemma zone is much larger, greater distance, just because we assume the drivers are speeding. Um, but essentially whatever that distance might be, let's say 250 feet, perfect, thank you. Um, and once they hit, say, a cone, um, oftentimes our advanced pedestrian warning signs are placed right at the beginning of this dilemma zone for drivers. Um, so oftentimes if we do have advanced warning signs, we use those signs. But if not, we flag it, mark it, and then the data collector goes on and crosses the road. We do this 60 times in one day, three different times of the day. So we make them kind of take a break in between. Um, and we do this quarterly for all of the crosswalks that we monitor. So we do uh, about 500-ish uh, data collections a year just within the pedestrian safety program. And from there, so we take kind of those averages over, over time um, and understand kind of what the driver behavior is. And we take that information and we take that back to the partner. Um, and then what we do is we look at what signage and what's the engineering that's there? What's the context that's at that crosswalk? Is it a school crossing? Is it a trail crossing? What type of activity do we see? And then from there, we recommend countermeasures. Those countermeasures could be, you know, you sh we don't have ladder striping. It could be just simple as striping the crosswalk. Right. Um, it could be as simple as adding advanced warning signs. It might be more, um, more specific, like adding pedestrian refuge islands to a multi-lane facility. Um, it could be reducing curb radii so that the crossing is shorter. Um, it could be rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Those are really popular among um, some of our partners here in um, the region because they draw attention to the drivers. And our data just shows that they work. Um, we've had crosswalks going back to the city of Kissimmee. Um, we had crosswalks at 30% yield rate and there was no improvement over time. And then we've added the rectangular rapid flashing beacon um, and it improved a little bit, but then we added some advanced warning signs. We added a stop bar, shark's teeth, and, and you start to see the drivers now pay attention. So I like to always say this to my traffic engineers, my planners, and my elected officials, is that if, if you ever know how to form a habit, right? The, the, first, right. the first thing for forming a habit is making it obvious. And so we don't do a very good job of making the places where we want people to cross obvious for drivers from the driver's perspective. And so we really are trying to enunciate and draw out where those drivers can expect pedestrians to be. And that makes pedestrians feel more comfortable using the crosswalks. Because oftentimes we hear from community outreach that we do that I just don't feel comfortable crossing there. Drivers aren't paying attention. Um, so we take all of that information back to our partners, work with them to try to improve the built environment. With the pedestrian safety program, it's not just engineering that we do, it is also education and it is also enforcement on top of the evaluation. 
Um, and the enforcement is important because oftentimes when our data collectors are out there, the driver's not going to understand why that person is crossing the road and making notes, right? And that's part of the education is going out to the community, talking to HOAs, going to events, educating on the driver yield law. And you'd be really surprised how many people don't know that's the law. And rightfully so. I had no idea when I started working for Bike Walk that that was the law. I knew common sense wise that if there was a crosswalk, that's where people cross and right. I shouldn't right. let them cross, right? But not necessarily know that um, it's a $164 ticket or three points on your license if you violate that law. Um, and so oftentimes we, we do this four times a year with our law enforcement partners where we go out and actually enforce the, the driver yield law. Um, right. We have... Um, and for, we have law enforcement officers go out and cross. Oftentimes they're giving warnings and or citations. That's up to the law enforcement agency. Um, but with that comes a educational pamphlet that really talks about the, um, the issues in the community, why we are the worst, why we're the number one for dangerous by design. Um, and we, um, and we really try to educate, not necessarily, you know, we're not out there making money off this program. We don't get any of the dollars from the enforcement. Um, we are really out there to educate. But part of that is also high visibility media and getting the media out and bringing them to see the enforcement operations. Of course, they like flashy things like this, so they often participate. But we love the fact that they come out because they're sharing our educational message. It's all about education and reminding drivers that that's the law. Um, so these are some great stats on the program last year, over 30 coalition partners, um, over almost 20,000 people. And those are actual discussions. Those are actual interactions, not just people that might come by the table. That's actual you know, conversations about the driver yield law. Um, and then over 900 warnings and citations issued, um, which is all of our enforcement partners combined over the year. So even though we're still reminding drivers regularly, um, you know, we're only hitting a small percentage of the actual population of Central Florida. And one of the things I would be remiss to not mention, John, is that um, we have about a thousand people moving to Central Florida a day. Um, and so there's, there's lots of people that are coming here that have no idea of our rules and our laws on the road. So we have to continue our education and continue our enforcement to remind even the, the new people that, that come and live in Central Florida that this is our rules, this is our law, and we want you to stop and let somebody cross the road yeah i'm lingering on this uh, particular image because it, it it brings up something that i saw earlier today which was a, basically a report that looked at yielding behaviors in uh basically an unprotected uh, crosswalk like this and motor vehicle speed and there was a direct correlation between what the speed of the motor vehicle drivers what they were traveling as they approach uh you know the the, the crosswalk and so uh, what is the, the, the tolerance or the palate or the willingness of uh, your, your cities and, and, and this region for doing what they can to lower those motor vehicle speeds? You had mentioned that it's not likely that they're going to be taking lanes away, but you know, is there some tolerance? Is there, there's, there's some openness to maybe narrowing the, the travel lanes and uh, creating a little bit, you know, going back to this photo, you know, narrowing that travel lane, creating a little bit of a buffer, having the, the beginnings of a buffered bike lane, which then maybe you can start installing some, you know, uh, protection in to, to be able to have a, a, a modestly protected bike lane. But then more importantly, helping to tame down those motor vehicle speeds so that it's not such a dangerous crossing. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned speed correlating with the yield rate, and that is something that we see within the program over our data all the time. So at higher speeds, the, the yield rate is much lower. Um, and, and that is something that we're having conversations with our partners on. There are some partners that are more willing to reduce speeds than others. Um, and there are some partners that make it... Um, to reduce a roadway speed, it requires um, the community to um, ratify that change, right? Um, so it really is, is the onus is on the community. And every community is different. So there's some communities that don't have anything policy-wise that says that they have to go through these steps to reduce the speed limit. Um, but others have that. So knowing kind of your constraints there. And then 
pivoting accordingly. So I know, for example, Osceola County is not going to reduce the speed limit anytime soon because that they have a policy that requires 60% approval from the community, but we can go narrow the lanes. We can go add advanced warning signs. We can use some countermeasures that still warrant drivers to pay attention there without necessarily having to rewrite policy and code for these communities. But they do know, uh, because most of them, including Osceola County, have adopted a Vision Zero um, uh, resolution. They're still working on their action plan and those projects uh, that go along with moving to vision zero. But ultimately, they all know that that's a part of what they need to do. But it's really based on context. You know, we, we really can't go in and say the Florida Turnpike, for example, we're going to reduce the speed limit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and there's certain, so the road that you had shown in that, um, on that slide is, um, is by the Kissimmee Airport. It happens to be a trail crossing that's there, but it's very industrial. There's large trucks moving through there pretty constantly. Um, and so we've talked about adding a pedestrian refuge island in the middle. Um, we've talked about um, reducing the speed limit. It's 45 and going down to 40. Um, but ultimately, the lanes really can't get narrowed because of all the tractor trailer movement that's there. So again, it's really based on context and it's really based on working with those individual communities and making, you know, having them recommend what they want to do and then saying, why don't you do just this step above? or this next thing. And they're, and they're normally receptive to that. Um, they will likely say, okay, we will do this. So for this example, uh, that crosswalk is now a rectangular rapid flashing beacon with a stop okay. bar and additional signage um, because we went in and did some intermediate stuff, added the stop bar and added the additional MUTDC signs, um, but really didn't get the yield rate that the partner wanted. I knew that that really needed to be an RFB. I recommended that to them, but they didn't want to spend the money. That's a little bit more expensive than just basic signage and striping. Uh, but once they saw that that didn't work, they went in and, and did the next best thing. And so it's a learning process for the individual cities and for the individuals that are doing that work to learn what works in their community. I've got another Seminole County up where I live. They, um, it's a 45 mile an hour road, it's by a school and it's a trail crossing. And I can't put a rectangular rapid flashing beacon in because it doesn't meet the context. It's too fast now. Um, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation says that those um, need to be pedestrian hybrid beacons or um, mid block pedestrian signals. Um, and I know the county is not gonna go install and spend six figures on doing that. So I said, let's reduce the speed limit. It doesn't, it's a different, it's not a rural road anymore. It's got neighborhoods on both sides. There's the school there. Um, and so instead of reducing the speed limit, they wanted to add um, yielding signs in the road. So they kind of added those pedestrian warning signs. Uh, did not change the driver yield rate at all. Um, and so we took that data back to Seminole County and we said, Seminole County, look, this didn't work. I really right. think that you need to go back, reduce the speed limit so that advocacy never stops. We right. just, we, we go in and we say what we can do with that partner. They tell us whether, what their kind of capacity and what their comfortability is of doing kind of those countermeasures. Um, and then we evaluate afterwards and give them that information. Um, yeah. City of Orlando is completely different. They're going, they're going to say, you know what, let's do a hard no, the hard and center line. Let's really reduce those curb radii. And they will go out and they will in-house engineer and design that work. And they will go out and construct it um, within three to five months. Um, and now we've got change that we can show. What's great about partners that do that type of work is that I can take that to Seminole County and say, Seminole County, look what the city of Orlando did. Right. Well, and then Kissimmee, look what city or, or Seminole County, look what Kissimmee did. And now they're sharing of information, sharing of data. Um, and that's what's great about the coalition is that they all get to talk to each other. Law enforcement from all the different regions, the traffic engineers and the planners all get to have these discussions amongst themselves to talk about these issues and share some of their problem solving and solutions. Um, and that has seemed to move the needle a little bit faster than even my advocacy work, because they're hearing it from somebody else that has done it tried and true. And we have some after data to prove that it worked. Yeah. One of the things that you said there uh, really uh, reminded me of one of the, the key tenets of, of active towns that I try to reinforce with folks as I'm you know having these conversations all around the, the globe is that it is imperative that community members speak up. It's imperative that community members get involved, get educated, and let their their leaders know, let the city leaders know, especially their elected officials, that 
this is something that we care about that we we want safer places to be able to walk and bike and uh it, it it's not well enough just to to sit back and say well you know we'll, we'll just wait until the government takes care of it it's like you have to get engaged you have to speak up uh you and, and and honestly, I also say that, you know, if your elected officials, you know, commit to to making, you know, changes and to, you know, committing to, like you said, Vision Zero, which you mentioned, it's like hold them accountable to that, mm-hmm. you know, make sure that that then rolls down from from the elected officials to the senior staff, uh, to the administration that is, you know, charged with, uh, OK, let's start moving and hopefully mm-hmm. moving with a sense of urgency, maybe some of these, uh, you know, the lighter, quicker, cheaper, tactical urbanism types of quick build things to be able to demonstrate um, that we can have that behavior change, which you mentioned earlier. So I wanted to go mm-hmm. to your website real quick uh, just to, uh, to to talk about that. So what's, what is the easiest way for your constituents, your audience that you have in Central Florida to engage with uh, Bike Walk Central Florida? There's a few different ways to uh, engage with us. We are always looking for volunteers um, and not just volunteers for events and things, but volunteers to help speak and share the message. Um, We often hire data collectors that are representative of the community. Um, We hire UCF students all the way up to seniors in different shapes, colors, and sizes. Um, And so we're always looking, and we we pay for that, so it's not necessarily looking for volunteers, but looking for passionate people to to help kind of change their community. Um, And and we've been really lucky and really successful at finding those individuals and then finding the community partners as well, um, local bicycle clubs, local um, health organizations, um, other nonprofits similar to us. Uh, There's an Orlando bike coalition that we work pretty closely with down, um, in Orlando, um, among others. And it's really just building those relationships. And when you find those passionate people, continue to, to put them in those places to continue to be passionate. Um, I, um, I serve per, um, uh, personally uh, as the vice chair of the Seminole County Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Um, so the county that I live in, I also work for, but um, I've been serving on that since, you know, before I was with Bike Walk. And ultimately, my goal there was to to help continue and build the trail system that Seminole County is is really done a fantastic job with building, um, but make sure that that was protected. I knew how important that was, um, especially working for the city of Castleberry. But in doing that, I used my voice you know, my personal voice to to continue to advocate and to continue to push how to make healthy and really resilient and sustainable communities um, outside of transportation, um, you know, connecting and building park places where the library is going and all of these different passions still feel, feed into creating active and sustainable communities. So even though that passion might not be for bikes and peds, for example, it's still something that we should be celebrating and it's still something that we should support. Um, so um, I, I, would, I would say that also one of the things that we're really lucky with is when we do our community engagement through the pedestrian safety program, Best Foot Forward, um, we are often at um, community events throughout the region. So we get a lot of antidotal information from just people candidly coming up to our table and telling us things. For example, uh, we were in Osceola County and there was a woman that came to an event in Celebration. Um, If you're not familiar, Celebration is the neo-traditional town that Disney built. Um, Yep. So we were in Celebration um, and not, you know, Celebration is a lot of automobiles as much as that's celebrated and built for the pedestrian. There's a lot of traffic that moves through there. Anyway, this woman has MS um, and she cannot use her hands to push the push button uh, to cross streets, right, to activate the pedestrian signal. Um, She uses her forehead. And unfortunately, she's had to reroute her where she um, uses her electric scooter because she could not reach the push buttons with her forehead. Um, So she made this note to us in in, a candid conversation. I I love what you do. Let me tell you about a little bit about me. Um, We took her story to the county. Um, The county called her. They figured out where she lived and where she was going. And in her route, her real route, not the one she had created because she couldn't get to the push buttons, they added extenders to those push buttons. So now she could just reach her forehead in, hit that button and activate that pedestrian signal without 
going out of her way to get to where she needs to go. So yeah. those, and now we've created an advocate out of her. So now she attends some of our events, she speaks out, we have her write articles. And so you, you have no idea who and how you impact someone's life when you go out and talk to them about anything like, you know, walking, biking and rolling, but ultimately it could go beyond that. Um, so we always try to advocate and continue to um, promote and to um, positively reinforce our volunteers to go out and be the advocates for us because I can't be everywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And I, I wanted to, to shift a little bit to, um, you know, this particular event that you guys produce and, and really my my thought of, of wanting to head in this direction it has has a little bit to do with the description here is um, being able to create, uh, you know, a, an experience for the community. It's one of the ways that you can engage with the community is get them, get them, you know, out to an event and, and be able to see their environment in a different way. And, and the thing that I love about this is uh, being able to show Central Florida residents of all ages and abilities an urban route where they can comfortably ride. And I suspect that there's something to do with the fact that uh, you had mentioned it earlier up in Seminole County, the extensive trail network system. Mm -hmm. um, I get the sense that that's one of the sort of hidden gems of the Central Florida area here is that there is an extensive off street network of trails perhaps just needs you know, some additional love and maybe connectivity issues and being able to cross some of those major barriers like that that mm -hmm. wide high speed street that we were talking about talk a little bit about this this event and 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 whether my assumption is is kind of heading in the right direction in terms of that off street network yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll start with your assumption. You are absolutely correct. We do have a very robust network of trails throughout um, Seminole, Orange, and Osceola counties that connect regionally as well. Um, okay. and, and I can talk about that a little bit later when we um, possibly look at our regional trail map, because I think that that would be right. a great um, visual for those that are watching. Uh, but essentially, Bike 5 um, it started out as, um, actually, it started in 2017. Um, and it really was the, um, it, and it's funny that you mentioned kind of the, what the event, you kind of read the description. So the event actually started because um, one of the cities that we work with, City of Maitland, installed some wayfinding signs or bike routes, if you will. So they put colors and numbers with a little bicycle um, on a sign and they stuck them up all over the city in residential areas, commercial, but there was no, there was no map. There was no community outreach. There was nothing that was done. There was a plan. They implemented said plan with signage and then they were done, right? Well, the um, residents came to the commission and were really upset that there was these random signs placed in their yard and they didn't understand why. And they were just very agitated and upset at the fact. And, and, and once the commission explained, these are the bike routes, well, where are the maps? And there wasn't anything to really show. Um, so the city of Maitland invited the city of Castleberry, which I worked at at the time, um, along with the Winter Park Health Foundation and the city of Winter Park to some neighboring cities to try to figure out how to solve this problem, right? So what do we do? Uh, they didn't want to remove the signs. They had spent a lot of money on the network um, and the study to identify where those bike trails might be. Um, and so I suggested maybe you should show them where they can ride, right? That seems logical. Let's encourage people to use it. Maybe they won't be so um, negative about it if they knew exactly what it was. Um, and so we devised an event at that point. Um, and then at that point, we got the city of Orlando involved and we included the town of Eatonville, which is the um, oldest historic incorporated African-American community in um, America. Um, and so we um, got them involved as well and created essentially a 28 mile route through the five cities um, and started doing what we call Bike Five Cities. So that event was born in May of 2017, and it was a large Peloton ride. Essentially, 250 people followed a bunch of ride leaders through that whole route. So fast forward to 2020, um, I take over the reins at Bike Walk, and now here comes our signature event. And 
that's just what I need is to hold a super spreader right during COVID um, as my first year as executive director, not something that I wanted to do. So we ultimately took a step back from the event and which had grown significantly. The um, 2019, we had over 500 people in that Peloton group. Um, it became a little challenging to try to keep all of them together. We had roads shut down with police support, but it just became a little bit logistically difficult to manage. Um, and so in 2020, we ultimately decided that you know maybe the big group ride isn't isn't how we encourage people to get out on their bikes yes it's a fun day out on your bike but i'm not if i go out on that big peloton ride i'm not necessarily paying attention as to where i'm turning where i'm at in my community uh, i'm just enjoying the event but if we made those groups smaller i might make pay attention to some of those points of interest and things that are along the way to kind of remember how to navigate because the route is a little twisty and turny you do go through some community and neighborhood streets to avoid some of those major strodes as uh, we like to call them so um, so ultimately, there you know you kind of need to know where you're going. So we we reduced those groups down to smaller group rides. Uh, we had lots more ride leaders and um, really tried to encourage more people to ride on their own. We marked the course out, showed them where they could get on the trails, get off the trails, and make that 30 mile or the 28 mile loop. And ultimately, that was a success. From there, though, we got a lot of feedback that, you know, I want to bring my kid or I'm a senior and 30 miles is a lot. You know, I just I, you know, my grocery store is only five miles away or my um, my work is only seven miles away. I don't necessarily need to do 30 miles to get to some of those activity centers or points of interest. So we we've created two smaller subsets of rides called the um, five, the bike five miles. And then we have bike five parks. So that's why the name changed. And that all happened actually this year in 2022. Uh, we change it to bike five generally, and we have five miles, the parks, and then the 30 mile ride for the five cities. Um, and the feedback that we've received has been very, very positive. Um, we've had a lot of people come out and enjoy the five and 11 miler and they are encouraged to come out for the 30, right? They're kind of inching their way to that. Um, and then we also got a lot more children involved with the five mile ride. Um, and it's, you know, you got to start them young. We have to teach them that it is, you know, teach them the proper ways to um, bike safety and put their helmet on. So we do helmet fittings as a part of this event as well. Um, we do a little bike rodeo to help them kind of get started. Um, we do a rock dodge so they can learn how to kind of swerve and avoid things and try to just teach them basic um, bicycle safety skills before we take them out on that five mile ride. That five mile ride is all trail based. We don't take them in on any neighborhood streets. The 11 miler is a little bit different. We we do have a couple areas where we have to get off, but again, it's very slow streets, 20 miles an hour, very little traffic. 30 mile one, there's a few areas where you do have to cross some major thoroughfares like 436 in Castleberry. Uh, that's one of the places where you have to cross. But ultimately, what's great about this is we bring in the elected officials. We bring in the traffic engineers and the um, planners and they ride the route. We bring FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation. They ride the route. They've been sponsoring this event for a few years as well. So it's really great to bring them out to ride the route year after year to see the changes that we are advocating for as a part of the event as well, like leading pedestrian intervals at some of the signals that's pretty easy to install. What about some no ride on reds where there is a significant trail crossing? And just reminding these people that, yeah, these are the projects that we want to achieve and right. we need to continue to work on achieving those year after year. Um, so we've seen some success in doing that. We've had some positive changes by, um, by having those individuals on the route. Uh, but ultimately, it just starts the conversation um, and it helps us kind of continue those advocacy um, messaging and, and allows us to continue to build those relationships with those partners so that if they do have an issue or do need an improvement, they come to us because they know we're experts, essentially. Fantastic. And speaking of partnerships uh, and and different uh, organizations that you're you're working with, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's going on here with the Healthy West Orange Trail connections. So I'm this one I'm really excited about because I I really think that this is um, really unique and individual to what we're doing here in Central Florida and I think should be and could be replicated um, across the nation. Uh, but ultimately, we're working with the uh, West Orange Healthcare District and the Foundation for a Healthier West Orange to bring together, establish a coalition around activating trail system for an um, a healthy community. Uh, so obviously, the healthcare district has kind of health in mind uh, with that kind of overarching health lens and in. 
2020, they realized that how we move impacts our, our physical, um, you know, health, right? Our health and well-being. Being in a car, you know, for several hours um, a week is not good for our physical health. It's not good for us socially or mentally as well. We're kind of isolated in that in that vehicle. So they realized that, and that's why they really wanted to grow that coalition. So we built those partners and supporting agencies over the last two years, um, and that includes all the partner cities in West Orange County, Ocoee, Windermere, um, South Apopka, Winter Garden, and um, I'm sure I'm forgetting what Horizons West. There's a few others. Um, but ultimately, our goal is to um, take their trails and their trail, their trail master plans, identify and look at all of those and see where they connect and try to connect them. So the foundation set aside $5 million for us to then go build these connections. But it's not just connections because that's only a part of activating, um, you know, you know, encouraging a healthy community. Uh, that money is also going to go to um, bike repair stations, restrooms, water fountains, all the support infrastructure uh, that that we need to feel comfortable getting out of our vehicle and getting onto a bike and kind of going those distances. You know, there's a little bit of I don't know if I can do this because I don't have the creature comforts that I'm used to, or at least that I can get to quickly with a vehicle. But if we can build those in and have those be accompanying to the, the signature trails that we have or even provide those where there might be trail connections or connections that we can create to parks so we can create additional trailheads. That's where we are taking some of the data that we have and kind of looking at um, um, how to how to make those connections and of course increase the the connectivity. Um, this is a great um, example of um, a partnership that uh, the, came out of the work that we're doing. Um, the Central Florida um, Expressway Authority CF, CSX. Um, they have um, they were a partner in this and they provided um, the permission and the landscaping for us to beautify part of the signature trail. Um, and beautification is a huge part of that comfort and the um, and that goes towards encouragement as well you know it's we often find that people in certain tra in certain areas don't maybe take a trail segment or don't go further because it just doesn't look nice there's no amenities there and so the goal here is to really improve the um, the the environment so that it is more comfortable so that you do say you know what I can't get on my bike and go there because I I have some shade and I have a bench and I have a trash can or I have water uh, and it's those things that you know we build it and they will come but they might not change their behavior. If we really right. want behavior change, we really want a community to, to start looking at active transportation as a mode of transportation. We've got to put all those other parts and pieces together, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that too, because I that's another one of the themes that I, I try to reinforce with folks is that, it, it, you know, the baseline level is safety. But we also need to make it beautiful. We need to really make it comfortable. And I'm glad you mentioned shade. You know, there's got to be that that aspect of, you know, is is it a, a tree canopied area? Can you get some shade, you know, a little bit of a break from the, the relentless heat? Uh, so with that all, all being said, let's let's shift back over to, to the trails. Uh, talk a little bit about the Packing District uh, Trail Study. Yeah. So um, we were really lucky with this project that um, the Dr. Phillips Charities and Dr. Phillips Inc. Um, are developers of the Packing District. So the Packing District is essentially um, a hundred acre redevelopment effort that is occurring just um, northwest of downtown Orlando. Um, and it's very industrial as its context currently sits. There are some rail line spurs that go in to feed into very industrial like businesses, building supplies, very, very much much very um, uh, industrial, very wide roads for all those tractor trailers to move through. Um, but Dr. Phillips was a um, um, ultimately a citrus farmer back in the early 1900s into the mid 1900s, um, owned lots of citrus farm, and this was their packing area. So this is the um, where they made the crates. This is where they packed the crates, put them on those rail spurs on the railroad lines, and then sent them out where they needed to go. Uh, but ultimately, Dr. Phillips is not in the citrus business anymore. They are more in real estate and redevelopment. Um, and uh, philanthropy, and so they are. Um, they they had a lot of these buildings and this area kind of set aside, and some of these buildings are still being leased out for industrial uses. But uh, they put a plan together, worked with the city of Orlando to redevelop this hundred acres into um, a really vibrant mixed use community. And it has a lot of really great bones. It's really it has some great connections already. Uh, but Dr. Phillips ultimately came to Bike Walk and asked us to develop an internal trail network to the Packing District. 
um, and also connecting it to the external trail network that is outside of that district. Um, and so we came in and kind of did a, a two-phased approach. We looked outside in and inside out to try to see where those connections could be. And ultimately we used the um, existing right-of-way of those roads. Like I said, they were really wide. I mean, we had a hundred foot right of, I mean, curb to curb, a hundred feet, which is a, and it's a two lane road, but these are tractor trailers moving through. So it was really, really wide, some staking, um, staging and stacking that was occurring. Um, and so we created kind of some complete street ideas and designs for them to consider. Um, and we also looked at building massing because they're, um, they're going to be building new buildings and there's going to be some existing buildings that they reuse. And so we had to identify where those buildings might be, identify the potential footprint of the new building so that we could really kind of align where those trails internal to the packing district could um, accompany those redevelopment efforts, especially because a lot of the stuff that's coming in are apartments and, and multifamily right. on top of kind of that first floor um, commercial and retail. Um, and so we, we wanted those buildings to really abut the trail. We wanted it to treat the trail as if it is um, kind of the front door where those people are kind of coming in and out. Um, and so that was the internal design, um, came up with a couple trailhead ideas, um, and ultimately Dr. Phillips adopted that, and they are moving forward with um, identifying and, and really kind of building out those trails along some of those railroad spurs currently. Then from there, we went in, like I said, connected it externally um, to different trail systems. So the city of Orlando is just to the south of where the packing district is, has a um, has a urban trail. Um, and so we wanted to connect to that, which is also by uh, UCF and Creative Village, as it's called, where the new downtown campus is. Um, and then to the um, to the east is a hospital. Um, and that hospital has a bunch of restaurants and um, activity nearby called Ivanhoe Village. And so we wanted to connect it to Ivanhoe Village. And then to the west is a community called Pine Hills. Um, and Pine Hills is a um, historically African-American community. It was a bedroom community of downtown Orlando in the 50s and 60s. And then just um, unfortunately, um, Kind of gentrified over time, um, but their convey Pine Hills has a connection to the coast to coast trail, and so ultimately we made and found an alignment to connect the packing district to the coast to coast trail, um, and so now we were able to have those internal connections to the external regional trail network. So now somebody can essentially go from Tampa and come all the way into downtown Orlando by the routes that we've identified. Some of these routes exist; and they just need wayfinding signage and the support of infrastructure we talked about earlier, some of them don't exist. And so next steps are the city of Orlando is looking at adding the trail routes into their um, bike ped master plan, also including some of these projects into their CIP, uh, because we can't go after federal or state grant dollars without those projects being identified within those um, community plans, within that uh, capital improvement plan. Um, and so that's really the next step. And then we will go after building. I mean, Dr. Phillips is interested in continuing to be um, a grant maker and um, and build some of that infrastructure that connects to the packing district. It's obviously a benefit to them, but ultimately it's a, a huge benefit to the community and they see how important that is and, and they see how, how this trail network could really help kind of transform the packing district and, and make it kind of um, accentuate that vibrancy that they were hoping to achieve with the development and the master plan that they put together. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned uh, Pine Hills, so I uh, went to this slide here, which is uh, going to highlight the uh, the region's first uh, trail mapping system that you guys are, are working on, and, and zero it in on Pine Hills, which is just in in the center of the screen here. If I pull back out, we'll we'll get to to the full slide here. Uh, talk a little bit about this project, and 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 really, I guess close us out with this. Uh, I think real strong suit that that the the region has, which is this off-street network of trails and how that really fits into the overall vision of uh, Bike Walk uh, Central Florida in, in being able to activate these, uh, make those connections. You mentioned connections, critical connections are so important. And then maybe even some creative solutions of, of getting past some of the barriers that are in place. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll tell you the, the story of the region's trail map. So um, again, city of Castleberry Hat, I went to Metro Plan Orlando with some um, partners and we really advocated that we needed a regional trail map. Um, the city of Castleberry was developing its individual trails. Our sister cities that are adjacent to us had their own individual trails. I knew what 
Seminole County was doing because I sat on their advisory board for the trail, the parks and trails, but nobody else knew that. So there wasn't really anybody or any or any entity essentially that was collecting this data um, from a regional standpoint. Um, and so that was 2018 when we, when we went into Metro Plan Orlando and had that conversation and nothing happened from there. Um, so fast forward to 2021, beginning of 2021, um, I had worked with an incredibly amazing consultant. This consultant not only created this first regional trail map, we worked with this consultant to do the Dr. Phillips study. Uh, we still work with this consultant to do our best foot forward data and do mapping for that. So um, this consultant, we I had a very friendly relationship with. We worked together for a long time. Um, and ultimately, I was complaining to him at dinner and drinks one night that we really still didn't have this regional trail map. And I was really just kind of disappointed. And I, I was like, hey, what's it? what would it cost for you to do this for us? Just, just, you know, throw me a number. And he gave me a, a number and it was $3,000. And I'm like, this is silly. We just need to pay this. Just do it. it. Right. Just do it. Right. Um, so I was like, get it done. I will find the money for it. And we did. We found two amazing sponsors, um, the Catalyst Group. Uh, they um, were actually fundamental in identifying the West Orange Trail right of way and helping the city of Winter Garden kind of design uh, their downtown around the West Orange Trail. So really, they were kind of like, no pun intended, trailblazers at the time. Um, right. So really appreciate the Catalyst Group. And, and they saw the need to have this, obviously. And then a, a new consultant that we work with called um, Hail Innovation. Um, and he does a lot of grant making. Um, and so this was really important for him um, as a consultant to have this tool because he does a lot of trail uh, grant writing. Um, and so we, I found the money and PJ, our consultant, went off to work and put this together. Um, ultimately, what we did was we went out to, um, we obviously try to pull in all the regional trail maps that we could, that we had access to, and then reached out to all of our partners, had them QC this, had them provide their geographic information systems data. Um, and then any time um, this is added or um, like a new trail connection is changed, we modify this and edit this. Um, this is just something that our consultant does for us on a regular basis. So the, the you know we don't have money reoccurring for this. We don't have a sponsor for that. But it, we just found that it was really important for the work that we do to continue updating this. So that's how the region's first trail map was born. So it's brand new as of a couple of years ago, last year, I should say, or 2021. Um, and, and to speak of kind of how I'm using this now from a closing those gaps and connections, how do we, how does BikeWalk kind of using this to activate it? Um, and ultimately that is, we're not only identifying that these signature trails exist, but we're identifying an active transportation network. Um, and now the advocacy comes in to where most of these signature trails are operated with park hours. Uh, so they're um, closed dusk till dawn. And that doesn't do somebody that's trying to use those trails for active transportation any good, especially if there's a tunnel. Some of like Seminole County closes their tunnels. So now you have to ride in the road or have to walk in the road, right? There's no safe access. So, so yes, we have this really robust trail network, but now the, the key is, is, is a changing kind of how we view that robust trail network and not necessarily for recreation, uh, but for transportation. And then with that lens in mind, where are the connections that people need to go, not for recreation, but for transportation? Where are the job hubs? Where are where is the transit hubs going to be? Where are the activity centers? Where is the, you know, the government services, the library, things like that, that we're identifying for our partners and putting on a map and then trying to figure out where's the route? How would somebody walk or bike from point A to this point? Um, and, you know, oftentimes it's, it's down the sidewalk of this major roadway, but that might be, not be the most, um, that might be not, not the most safe. It's not essentially encouraging to walk or ride your bike down a five foot sidewalk adjacent to a brick wall and, you know, five lanes of 50 mile an hour traffic for a mile and a half. It just, you know, that doesn't sound great. Um, and it's, and it's not, it's not perceived as being comfortable either. Right. So often people take to the trails because it is a lot more comfortable, it's safe, and it is um, a little bit more convenient for them. And so we want to try to make the those parts and pieces work for all of active transportation and get our partners to see that the trail system that they're building currently can can pivot to that and can be used for that as well. 
Um, and I, again, it's just kind of sh- changing mindsets, changing kind of the, the, um, the, the way we think about things. And that is a lot of times through conversations, through advocacy and through the volunteers and the others that have the same passion that we have at Bike Walk. I love it. I love it. All right. So, hey, folks, if you're tuning in from the Central Texas or Central, I, I almost said Central Texas, Central Florida area. Uh, hey, please get engaged, get involved. Um, talk to your neighbors about these types of things. Take a look at the website. There's ways that you can get involved. You can sign up for the newsletter. There's, you can become a volunteer. And if you really get passionate about it, consider uh, joining the board and, and, and really, truly making a difference. And, uh, and, and again, donors and partners, Nonprofit organizations, they absolutely have to have the support of the overall community. And so huge shout out to uh, to all of these names and and, or of organizations that uh, are are doing that. Uh, It it is such a huge, huge uh, help to to be able to move these initiatives forward. So, you know, thank you so much and a huge shout out and thank you, Emily. Anna, mm-hmm. for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such a joy and such a pleasure. And I need to come visit you. You do. You do. <laughs> come for Bike Five Cities, October 14th, 2023. Yeah. And hey, that's probably a good time of year to come. Is a yeah. little bit into the fall, not quite as hot. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful like it. time of year to go for a bike ride in Central Florida. Yeah. See, <laughs> well, there you go. Okay. I've been officially invited, so I'm going to have to figure out a way to, to make that happen. Again, Emily, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns thank podcast. You. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion with Emily Hanna. And if you have, please give it a thumbs up, (laughs) share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Uh, Just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell to customize your notification preferences. And uh, hey, I'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.